from um, LRMG, uh, Omri Yari, um, extensive experience um, in the field of digital learning experiences. And, um, you know, it seems as if his presentation really is going to focus on, you know, the concept of a digital workforce transformation. You know, what does it look like? How do we build the skills to drive business outcomes? And I think, you know, probably um, many executive minds is this concept of digital transformation. Um, it's almost like, like this whole, um, you know, fourth industrial revolution. Everyone is talking about it, yet no one actually knows what it is. I think it's just a word thought of by consultants to confuse clients, to pay them money to help them make sense of something that doesn't really exist. Um, but I'm gonna, we're gonna invite him into, into the conversation. He's gonna take us through to about quarter to 11. Again, as you did now, please do engage via the chat. Um, Omri, the uh, floor is yours. Thanks so much, Anku. Um, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think a lot of the stuff is made up by, by consultants um, to create business dependencies on, on, on advice and confusion and, and fear mongering. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, it's a good springboard and we, we're caught in the crossfire in a sense as, as learning professionals with the urgency of, of developing people, but there is a, a lot of truth to it as well. And what I will do, just confirm that... Uh, that everything is visible there in full visible screen. Visible at the same time, yeah. Let me. Um, you said in present or in full screen? Well, it is full screen. Perfect, sure. Um, so it's a big topic to cover in, in 30 minutes, and I hope there'll be some questions. But so what I will do is I'll, I'll try and, um, and cover. Let me just get this screen out of the way. Yeah, I'll try and cover three main things. Uh, talk a little bit about strategy, and you just heard in Kutcher's presenta presentation how important strategy is for LNT professionals and how we need to get closer to what our business is, is talking about, what they're trying to achieve. And I, I often, I mean, for a long time, I struggled with the word strategy because, again, it's something that, that is, is quite, quite ambiguous. So try and think of it as transformation in itself. Uh, I think transformation is a synonym for strategy because all it is is a roadmap for a company to go from where it is today with its own value propositions, its customer set and its competencies to where it wants to go in future, which is sometimes different. You might be attracting new customers, developing new propositions and need different skill sets and competencies to get there, which sets up nice, nice, nicely to talk about skills development. And we're going to talk about some considerations and approaches as LD professionals and talent development professionals, what we, we should be doing more of and less of. And finally, agility. So agility is, is another buzzword made up by consultants, Yanku. But uh, it is it is a nice way to think about how do we become more responsive? How do we prioritize? How do we uh, invest our time into thinking strategically and partnering rather than um, having our assistants print our emails. So if we're going to start with strategy, I couldn't I couldn't overlook this guy. He's one of the the, the greatest strategic thinkers of our time, Jack Welsh, ex-CEO of, of General Electric. What was surprising and enlightening for me is when this quote was said. So Jack Walsh said, an organization's ability to learn and translate that learning into action rapidly is the ultimate competitive advantage. And I don't know if the fingers are still warm and if anyone wants to hazard a guess when that quote was, was said. It couldn't have been more true, couldn't be more true than it is today. So I'll give that a second, I won't wait too long and I'll let you know the answer. It's just remarkable that the foresight of the importance of learning as a competitive advantage. Almost. 60s might be a bit far off, but it was 24 years ago, so in 1998, Jack Welsh said that, uh, and still and still true today. What 
I guess we, we're doing now and, and we're learning and a lot of organizations are spending a lot of time researching this, this concept of digital transformation, as you said, Yanku, and, and how that informs our strategies, our, our visions and transformations as organizations is what actually drives the strategic change in our business. Um, is it people? Is it what we do? Is it collaboration or technology? What Fujitsu found and interesting as a, as a technology-based business is actually it's not the technology. Oh, it's not as much the technology as you would think. Technology in itself is not a differentiator. It's not a competitive advantage. Any company can today spin up an Azure or AWS cloud server farm, but um, what you do with it counts. Anyone can spin up a data warehouse with the ability to store and process as much data as you can possibly consume, but it's how people use that. What, how do they behave? How do they think? And what are their attitudes that really informs organizational strategy and digital transformation strategy execution? I think EOH said it best in, in one of their strap lines. Technology makes it possible. People make it happen. So if digitally transforming is this key to greater productivity and competitiveness in a, an ever more competitive market space, then how do organization actually digitally transform? And I thought I'd share a little video. There haven't been too many videos in the conference, but this, this guy I love, his name is Eddie Obeng. He's a Henley Business School professor. And he has a view on digital transformation and what organizations do, which I really love. And I thought I'd share with you. Maybe yeah, sure. I'll try it once more. And if not, we'll go through. Over the past few years, I've oh, had fun go. watching go. organizations Sorry. digitally transform. Why fun? Um, because they, they do different things. The most common one is companies who focus on efficiency. When you talk about digital transformation, when they say it, what they mean is we're looking for ways to be more efficient at doing what we currently do. And, and that's fine, but it's not transformation. Then there's another Another group of companies who also amuse me, what they do is, you know how when you're going out and you've worn the same outfit for a while and you decide I'll put a scarf on, I'll put a little um, a handkerchief in my pocket, they accessorize. So they go, right, we're going to digitally transform by giving everyone super fast iPads or by getting a blockchain to put it. They simply add to their existing organization's way of working. The third one is even funnier because they think they're transforming. But you know how the, the way in which horse-drawn carriages turned into cars they call them horse-drawn carriages then they put the engine and they took out the horse but if you think about it the person who was originally at the back of the horse-drawn carriage had paid for the the, the 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 driver had paid for the horse and now had a horse sitting in a field so they got really upset and they almost wanted to bring the horse back into the horse-drawn carriage this is what organizations sometimes do when they see the technology, they want to fit into what they do. They'll say things like, how does this new opportunity fit in with what we currently do? In other words, they're not willing to give up what they currently do, and they're making a mistake. You see, they make the classic mistake. They think that a butterfly is simply a caterpillar with wings stuck on it. And it's not true. A butterfly isn't just a caterpillar with wings. Caterpillars have certain competences and ways of working. They can eat leaves, they have lots of legs, and so on and so forth. Butterflies fly, they have long proboscis for, for drinking lots of nectar. The skill set of the two are completely, dis completely disconnected. There's no connection between them. Transformation means breaking something and building something new. It's three processes. You've got to keep the caterpillar alive, you've got to build the scaffolding, the chrysalis, and then you've got to build all the skills in order to allow it to fly. And that's what digital transformation is about. So when you look about at a culture which is trying to drive digital transformation, unless it has those three elements in it, it's not going to transform. You'll just get more of the same or accessorization or just efficiency improvements. As an individual in an organization, look around you and try and work out which part of the organization you're contributing to. Are you involved in keeping the caterpillar going? In other words, the more of the same, keeping business as usual. Or are you the person who's making the bridges? This is the new set of customers. These are the new products we're going to be producing. Or are you the person who's actually creating the future? All of the three are relevant and all of them need to be done. But be very clear, if you're a leader or a manager, what you're contributing and make sure your colleagues understand that as well. And then you can digitally transform. Over the so 
Eddie in that video says that a, a caterpillar is uh, a butterfly is not a caterpillar with wings on it, stuck on it. And I think that that's true in the same way that doing a Python course doesn't make you a data scientist. So, but what, what I think I have an issue with or is a challenge in what Eddie says in that video is that he says that uh, as an individual in an organization, look around and see which part are you contributing to? Are you keeping the caterpillar alive? Are you building the bridges? Or are you creating the future? And the alarming fact is, and some of this research is a little bit older, but John Cotter, who's uh, the change management guru, found that 70% of all employees, even yours, are knowing, unknowingly misaligned with your company's strategic direction. So they don't actually know necessarily which role they play or which part of their transformation strategy they're contributing to. That was at least an improvement on what Kaplan and Norton found in, in their publication, is that as much as 95% of companies' employees are unaware of or do not understand the strategy, which creates an opportunity for us. So necessity breeds innovation. It falls on us often as L&D professionals and the relevance and, and I guess, rebirth of L&D as, as an important function in business, it falls on us to build those bridges and be conscious of the gaps that we're filling um, within the business and what capabilities and skills we're developing. But I guess the big question for us is, what are the skills that we need to build? What does our particular business need in order to stay relevant and competitive? So a lot of you are probably familiar with this that the World Economic Forum publishes uh, a Future of Jobs report where they listed these 10 roles for 2025. And I guess by now, most of these are, are not completely foreign. Some of them are actually quite traditional. And in, in reflecting on the conference so far and what's still on the agenda, the skills associated with those roles are, are quite familiar for us and we quite aligned and we've already talked about learning and creativity and leadership and resilience and that has come into our conversations quite strongly. But the challenge is that as many as half of all employees need to be reskilled in some way or another in the next three or so years in order to remain relevant. And executives and business leaders are expecting that to happen on the job in the flow. So, who needs to be reskilled? When do we need to reskill them and what do they need to learn? We left in this place where we need to, to make a judgment call on transitioning these capabilities and skills so that we do keep the caterpillar alive, build the bridges and create the future and, of, and build this butterfly as we go. So we need to assess, uh, identify and assess these expiring skills which are losing relevance for our business over time and when that might happen as well as which are the more relevant emerging skills for our future business what we need to do and we've uh, we've used this this acronym as we've engaged with our customers and uh, and colleagues is that we need to run we need to reskill upskill and multi-skill uh, and new skill so reskilling talks to those roles that are possibly going to be disrupted by robotics and automations and all those innovations we're bringing into business. Who's not going to have a job in five years' time because of the innovations that we are implementing? Upskilling is an elevation and evolution of existing roles within the business that need to do things differently to stay relevant. And finally, there's new skills, which are these emerging skill sets coming with new technology and new methodologies that are coming into business. What we want to do is we want to do this as effectively as possible and make sure that this happens smoothly and that we're meeting the business's objectives and timelines as we go. So how do we maximize that effectiveness? And if I wanted to really bore and torture you, I would I would share my my master's research of, of 11 years ago where which studied the correlation and the, uh, and the link between a corporate learning environment and all of its components and the perception of program effectiveness as perceived by Kirkpatrick's and Phillips in, in ROI and learning evaluation models. But 
I'm not going to do that, although there's a lot of science behind what happens. What I will do is I'll briefly share a learning maturity framework, which has been developed over, over many years by one of our partners, Skillsoft. And what it does is it creates a context for which we can place ourselves along a level of, of maturity and how we're creating an ecosystem which drives not just accessorization, as Eddie puts it, but really creating a ubiquitous learning ecosystem that drives and fuels self-directed learning in the flow of work, moving across five stages. And what they've found is that those five stages are determined by six key indicators. Uh, one of them being this organizational culture, as we often speak about this, this mythical learning culture. Um, our governance and, and policies which inform our learning practices for learning and for learners and managers, this ecosystem that we're creating, which is becoming more and more complex every day with learning experience platforms and learning record stores and LMSs and talent platforms and integration and cloud, managing and understanding that environment. On the right-hand side, importantly, the alignment and integration with business strategy and objectives, doing the right things, teaching the right things. And how do we make people aware of those opportunities to learn? Are they adopting them and engaging with them over time? And for me, the most important one and where we, we spend a lot of our, our work is in, in value realization, not as perceived by traditional learning metrics and stats. It's not about consumption and completion and certification and bums in seats, but as perceived by your stakeholders and sponsors, have we driven business impact? Have we reduced risk? Have we increased customer satisfaction? Have we saved money, made money, engaged people more effectively, retained our talent? So over the past 25 years, LRMG has studied what are the big predictors of, of value. And I guess it might be obvious uh, and if you if you jump into our booth during the conference we'll we'll schedule a free assessment with you there's a, there's a survey that you can complete with your team and we can present that information back to you you know we we've looked at this idea of organizational performance for for many years and has have evolved as a business with the evolution of products and systems and platforms in the human capital space and we found that the most successful learning and development teams actually align quite tightly with organizational strategy and they have great business acumen they're able to understand where the business is where it's going what skill sets are required and really they, they help co-create these target operating models which are informed by the critical skills and future roles on the organizational strategy side and respond accordingly with Things like capability academies are quite popular right now, but all the way through from formal and informal learning programs, performance improvement programs, and, and other self-directed learning opportunities, which they make available to, to people within the organization, such that it creates this concept of talent on demand. But there's a, there's a missing, a key missing ingredient in this picture still, which is a self-fulfilling and perpetuating driver of this model and ecosystem within organizations. And it's something that we're hearing quite a lot of now when we're talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Actually, the addition of this idea of belonging within an organization for people, that engagement and what we call the high performance golden circle in LRMG, this idea that in order to, to fully unlock a discretionary effort and commitment from employees, there's got to be a sense of belonging. And there's a lot of barriers to that. So Many of you know there's a big driver of engagement is the feeling that my personal journey and even my career journey is tightly aligned with that of the organization. We're going in the same direction. I feel like I can learn, I can grow, I can perform, I can collaborate, and I can contribute meaningfully to this organization. That's what drives that engagement. But it's, it's really easier said than done to prioritize and to deliver value consistently to business. So what are some of the tactics, methodologies, and I guess methods that we can employ as L&D professionals, how do we evolve our own skill sets to, to become more relevant in business? 
And several years back, I was working at a software development business and I did a certified Scrum Master course just when Agile started becoming popular as a software development project management methodology before it became a big um, broad business objective. And I found it to be a wonderful philosophy and methodology for success. And I just wanted to share a lens of that methodology, Scrum in particular, with you as L&D professionals, so that you can understand how you can apply more agile ways of work with your teams and within your organizations. So the first thing that's, that Scrum allows us to do and agile allows us to do is, is prioritize. It's doing the right things at the right time. But as businesses change and evolve and transform, that becomes unclear to us. And I know dealing with a lot of learning and development functions, as soon as you start talking about IT and digital and the business says, you know, we want to develop cloud skills, it just get a little bit nervous because it's so broad. Is it AWS or Azure or Google Cloud or CompTIA saying cloud doesn't really give us much clarity around what we need to, to develop? So we're going to get a lot of it, a lot closer to business or business owners or product owners, as they're called in, in Agile, because they're the ones that are sitting with the pain and the opportunity. They know what their strategy is. They know what people and skills they need in order to execute their strategy. We can't because it changes so quickly. And we, we aren't really expected to. And I guess our opportunity here is to strengthen that relationship and partnership with the business owners that they see us as interested and listening and asking good questions and immersing ourselves in their strategy so that we can deliver more value continuously to them. There's always going to be more to develop than we can do at any point in time. So prioritize that and estimate the effort in something called a people development backlog, potentially. So who do we need to develop? What do we need to develop over time? And that's going to be a really long list. And you'll spend time looking at that list a lot. Um, but then with your team, take that list with its priority and effort estimations that might be instructional designers or learning consultants or learning specialists and share what you've heard with the customer or bring the team to those meetings if you could and select what you're able to deliver in a time box period. So define a sprint as typically it's two, a two-week cycle. It's not too short, not too long. It gives you enough time to, to achieve a fair bit if you're focused and directed. In that time, you could engage with the vendor around a certification or develop an e-learning module or run a short proof of concept, do an awareness campaign, or even develop a value report back to, to business to show the value that, you, that you've achieved through learning. And that then consolidated into a confirmation of what we're going to deliver as a team, not just individuals, within that sprint period. And that becomes your scope for the next two weeks. And then as a team leader and contributor in the organization, assume the role of a scrum master. And really all that a scrum master does is meets with the team daily, assesses the progress, what's done in progress hasn't been started and identify any impediments. What are the barriers to making that progress, to implementing that change that, that we need to overcome in order to, as a team, help each other achieve our sprint objectives. Once you've done that at the end of a two week period, you'll release an increment or increments things that we've contributed that may not be a whole thing, but part of a larger scope or initiative that get us closer towards our bigger goal. And then the hardest part of all, I guess, is going back to the business and asking for feedback, saying what's worked, what hasn't, what should we do differently? That's important to accelerate that learning loop and that feedback loop so that we are continuously learning and evolving and making sure that we're listening, we're hearing the customer and we're adapting our approaches accordingly. And that then flows through from your client engagements into your personal team engagements and this idea of a retrospective. And a retrospective is really a commitment to continuous improvement. It's analyzing what worked in the recent press sprint, what didn't, what do we want to do more of, what can be improved. And Two methodologies that I've found worked in, in, in that context is a simple stop, start, continue. What shouldn't we do anymore? What should we continue doing or start doing? Or there's another good one called a mad, glad, sad exercise where you ask the team to list what made them happy or sad or angry 
during the sprint and respond accordingly to make sure that there's more happiness and less sadness, certainly less, less anger. So I guess in, in summary, adopting this mindset and understanding the context of, of skills development within our business, all that's left is to practice what we preach. And as we say in LRMG, drink our own champagne. And Katya also mentioned this, so space learning and repetition is also part of the process. So we're doing a bit of that now. But it's important that we ourselves reskill, upskill, new skill, so that we continue to, to broaden our knowledge and deepen our specialization across multiple areas and become this idealistic comb-shaped individual that understands the business quite broadly and has capability, broad capability, which I'll discuss in my, in my final slide next, as learning and development pretension. practitioners, how do we become more strategic partners to business and stakeholders? And I'll, I'll end off with, in true L&D style, with our PDP, our personal development plan. So having said what we have and learned what we have around strategy and skills development and agility, what do we need to go back and do? We need to think more strategically, understand your business strategy, how you're going to differentiate and compete, be that 5% that actually knows what part of, of the process they contributing to, building the future, keeping the caterpillar alive, building the bridges, which part are you playing? Also, and that speaks to business acumen. And for me, in my team, this is the most important skill set is know how your business makes money, how your business converts resources into value for customers and know that you're contributing meaningfully to that, to that process. The idea of business partnership, really important. Ask questions, learn to ask generative questions. What would need to be true? Who would you need to, to have in place? What can be improved in order for you to execute on a strategy? And then go back and innovate and analyze how you can help make that progress. Embrace Agile, you know, become a great scrum master, help your team overcome challenges, track progress, become more methodical in what you want to deliver to the business and become data driven. It's part and parcel, you know, track, understand and use your data to make better decisions as a team, as an individual, as a learning function and become better marketers and the best definition that I've heard of, of marketing is acquiring and retaining the right customers. And that's an important distinction. It's who are your audiences? Who are you targeting? Who needs to be developed? Make sure that they are aware of what you're offering and keep them engaged to make sure that that transformation and learning actually happens. And it goes without saying, be continuous learners. Practice what we preach. Learn daily. Share what you're learning. Engage your team and others ultimately to become more inspirational leaders and contributors within the organizations, inspire others to be the same, be a change champion for personal development, creating future-proof, resilient and sustainable businesses. Thank you very much. I hope that you learned at least one thing from the presentation and be really happy if there's some, some questions to be, to be discussed. Amri, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, colleagues, please do make use of the chat if you do have any questions. There was one already that came through just with regards to that video. I'm asking for the, the transcript. Um, I think if we, uh, maybe if you wouldn't mind, Amri, if it's possible to maybe share that video. I don't know if it's available on YouTube or uh, as we've heard, uh, I don't know if it's available on TikTok. Um, <laughs> I need to... I need to, to get to that. Like, my, my boys will come to me. Oh, look at this video. Oh, the to do I list, watch yeah. TikTok. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so thanks, uh, learning colleagues, please, uh, you know, please, uh, please do share. A um, couple of things on, on me that, that stood out for me that I want to play back as people are um, just typing and firing away at, at some questions is, yeah, I think the, the video really resonated with me as well. I think great analogy about transformation. Um, it is not just putting in technology to continue doing the same process, continue the same process. Um, and I think that's, you know, we, we need to change our own view as to what transformation really means. I and mean, I think we need to educate our stakeholders that when they use the word transformation, what do they really mean? You know, leveraging again what Katya said is, do we ask enough questions when they talk about the concept 
of transformation, okay, is that uh, you just want to put a scarf on, um, on a broken process to, to hide where it's broken. Um, so I think that's something that really resonated with me, practical things about reskilling, upskilling, new skills, and I really loved your, um, your infinity loop um, that, you, that you positioned there. Um, reminded me of um, Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. It's a book I recommend that you, you guys read. Um, and I was waiting, I was waiting, otherwise I would have asked it. I was waiting for the circle in the middle. Um, <laughs> you know, and I was just reflecting on, on another book I just finished reading, uh, B2.0 by Jim Collins and Bill Glazier, um, think, uh... which is about preserving the core. You know, stimulating progress, and they start that entire book. Um, if you're not familiar with the works of Jim Collins, my view, great management thinker, read all of his books. Please do put that on your list. It's about what is that vision, what is that purpose? Because that is something that that resonates people. That is why we get out of bed, um, you know, in the morning. And I really great to see that sort of sitting at that core because you cannot have a strategy. The strategy is a means to an end. And what is that end? The end is that vision. The end is that purpose. Um, and again, in our experience resonating with what you said, I think that's what a lot of organizations miss is they, they've got the means, but to what end? Um, and then they don't have the people capability to communicate that means to, to people. And that's why, you know, that's that from Kaplan Norton and there are many others as well that sort of, um, you know, that, that say that. Um, let's just have a look at some of the uh, questions coming through here. I'm glad we persevered with the video. <laughs> so a very practical question here you, you mentioned in your um sort of self-development you speak about you know being data driven in your experience also supporting organizations for a number of years uh, what are some of the the data that you recommend uh, you know l d actually really concerns them with you know in your in your view what what moves the needle Excellent question, and it's something we we continue to grapple with. We recently had a had a client webinar where we spoke about data science and and the implications of data. We actually have a behavioral economist working for us, and the sort of things that are important for us is is catch people where they're most receptive. Is so time of day when people learn, day of the week, align your communication strategies and awareness strategies with when that learning is happening. You know, what identify what pockets within your organization. A learning culture doesn't happen all at once. A learning culture happens through managers and leaders who make time for learning, who give permission to learning. Who are those people? Identify who are the influencers to the TikTok narrative, Yanku. Um, who's influencing the organization to learn? And where is there really very little learning happening? And and use that data to to partner and engage the appropriate business functions to celebrate and reward and recognize where it's happening and address where it's not. So that over time, you're minimizing the amount of people which aren't engaging and maximizing those who do. Love it. And then we've got a, a very interesting one coming through here, a little bit more about HR operating model. Um, where is l and best positioned? Is it, is it a sub-function of the broader human resources? Is it, should the chief learning officer or whatever we want to call it, um, does that carry the same weight as the chief people officer or HR officer, whatever? You know, there's so many names floating around these days. Your thoughts on, on, on the importance of that? And if it is a subset, then how do we influence? Um, how do we create a space where leaders realize and appreciate the value that the subcomponent um, actually adds to the broader organization. I have a slightly controversial view in that learning and development is a, is a skill and not a department necessarily. I think that learning and development, the ability to, to learn in a self-directed way and develop your people and teams in the direction that you wish to go is something that needs to happen within the business across multiple layers. We are an enablement function. We create the technology and the ecosystem and the, the means of learning, but driving learning, influencing, informing, and inspiring learning is, is a line function. 
actually. And the challenge that we've seen and the biggest, the biggest accelerators of learning is real line manager engagement. They need to see the value of sharpening the ax. So taking the time, reduce productivity for a certain period of time to get greater returns over time. And in Agile, you see that um, something called a burn down chart, where as you learn, you bring learning into your, into your sprints, you're able to do more in less time and you're able to deliver more output in a shorter period of time as you develop your skill sets. Equally within business, we need to be able to, through data and value realization, show managers and leaders the important role that they play in driving learning. We, we, we did a launch for, for a client the other day. Um, and the, still singularly, the most the biggest barrier to learning that they expressed was time to learn. That is not valued by the manager or leader. This was a, a technology services company. People are billable at a specific rate. And so managers value that time with the client. But what if you could spend two weeks improving that person's capability, charging them out at a higher rate, making them more productive within your organization? We've got to be able to demonstrate that in a more meaningful way. And it's not just about completion of a specific curriculum. It's about the acquisition of a skill set which is more valuable to you as a business function. And I think, you know, what, what comes to mind as you say that is that, that picture of a snail that uh, Katja had in her presentation is sometimes you need to slow down to speed up. And um, I, I share your experience where, you know, people will only allow the behavior that impacts sort of the bottom line. And um, if a great example that you use there, if Bottom line is the number of billable hours, meaning that someone is someone is going to not be billable. Then most likely is going to impact my KPI, and my KPI is going to impact my increase in my bonus. So yes, I'm not going to allow uh, people time to learn. So it really goes on bigger about creating that ecosystem. We need, we've got a client that realize that, and they actually said that no, we understand this, but learning and slowing down is important to us. So the amount of time you allow people to learn has actually got a moderating effect on your financial and personal financial income. Sometimes you need to be a little bit more mechanistic at the beginning, um, you know, to create that type of, of ecosystems until it becomes second nature, until it becomes part of, of the business. I've got a question. Um, Extend the what's in it for a, me to the manager. True, true. The concept of self-directed learning Maybe a little bit of a provocative view, but does it really exist? The fact that I need to remind people to go and learn is not really self-directed. It's still driven by me. So how can we practically move along that maturity curve so that self-directed is really self-directed? It's not us reminding people that they need to go and learn. It's a perfect question for you, and we, we use your tool and love it. Um, and part of it is a strengths assessment and self-development is not a strength that many people have. And I, I talked to my team about the technology adoption curve to say that only 12 and a half percent of your organization are these innovators and early adopters in the same way that only that percentage of people are self-directed learners. You're not going to change that. You got to, to find different ways to entice people and motivate people to learn because it progresses things that are important to them, like their earning potential, like their rank and status or brand within the organization. And it's not a one size fits all. You know, a very small, realistically, portion of our, of our organizations are going to be self-directed. Others, what I keep saying to, to people is, what do people learn in organizations? What their manager tells them to learn. And pretty much nothing else, unless you are one of those very rare individuals who actually wakes up in the morning and has this drive for personal self-development and has that strength. Mm -hmm. I think you mentioned it earlier is then maybe that we need to have peace with exactly that statistic. Yeah, that's part yeah. of every second person is the world champion or the Olympic champion because not everyone's got what it takes. There are many people with maybe more talent, but not enough people with grit and uh, you know, dedication and discipline to, to get there. So maybe let's let's make peace with the fact that, hey, not everyone is going to be like that. 
but maybe I need to shift my focusing to identifying those people who are and to leveraging them as influencers to create that. It's not about top title, it's not about hierarchy, it is about leveraging that ability that they have to display self-directed learning and then they can influence and um, you know, co-create together the type of culture that we are looking for. Um, yeah, Kamala said, yeah, agreed. Some people are self-directed naturally and others need nudges and others are kicked. And sometimes I think more than a, more than just one nudge and uh, more than just uh, one and, kick. And some laggards will just not get there. And we shouldn't expend all that energy on people that are just not going to, you can take a horse to water. Spot on, spot on. 